Thanks very much for the invite and hello to everyone. I'm very happy to present uh, some of our work on uh, Griffin and kind of Hawk and essentially L language models which don't use attention uh, but actually use linear occurrence. <laughs> Let's start. This is a joint work with a um, quite large team. Now for, I think, over a year and a half, we've been uh, pushing kind of the frontiers of how, how further we can scale up um, state-based models to replace attention. And kind of the main goal is to understand first what kind of situations this is possible and in what kind of situation maybe you actually do need attention. And I'm going to talk about this kind of at the end of the talk more with some of the results. I'm going to start with slightly uh, how do we motivate and what was initially in the field, uh, how um, state-based model emerged. And kind of historically, if we look very, very further back before even Transformers, the main sequence to sequence models that people used was kind of vanilla recurrent networks. And usually one of the main difficulty with those models was that they were slow to train. And this is mainly because of their sequential nature. And here, when I say slow, uh, I mean just in comparison to transformers, which are usually much faster to train and which is the main reason why they kind of take over the field is that essentially during training, they process the whole sequence in parallel and that allows them to actually be trained much faster. That drove kind of the main um, stream towards scaling them up and they also showed really good performance. And obviously in RNNs, there's things like LSTMs and GRUs that kind of address some of the slow training issues, which were vanishing gradients in vanilla RNNs, but essentially they still remain sequential. And on the other hand, transformers are very fast to train, and now we have optimizers that actually train them very well um, as well. However, one of the main drawbacks that uh, is emerging more and more, especially as we look at longer sequences to process, is that the uh, number of flops that they need to compute is uh, squared in the sequence length. And in addition, because you need to store the key value cache when you want to predict new tokens, um, essentially that starts to make them slower during inference time and in general more difficult to scale when we increase the sequence length. So kind of starting from this, I'm not going to go into the whole history of what state-space models are, uh, since that's a very, very, very long talk if I need to give that. And instead, I'm going to kind of try to do this uh, simplified view of what the most modern state-space model architectures are and kind of the one that we published in our paper, which I think is a more useful way rather than uh, sort of motivating everything from the way that it emerged in the field. And kind of modern SSMs essentially are just linear diagonal recurrent layers. Uh, this, I think, is kind of the easiest way to think about them without any additional complexity of uh, some of the continuous um, state space model perspective and so on. And one of the main benefits of um, this structure is that because they are both linear and diagonal, uh, that makes them easy and fast to train because uh, now they still have sequential nature, but actually you can parallelize it. And additionally, because they are diagonal, you have a lot more flops. So even if you compute it sequentially, it's very fast. And because they're essentially just on RNN layers, their computation scales linearly with the sequence length. And also they compress the sequence to a fixed states, uh, state size, which makes them uh, a lot faster during inference. And kind of during the talk, I'm going to uh, essentially try to describe some of the learnings that we had uh, leading up to our publication uh, of our paper. One of the main questions that essentially we wanted to answer when we started this project, and I think kind of the field is uh, even still going in this direction, is can we match the capabilities of transformers at scale, which is kind of the main thing that uh, we care about, since uh, at larger scale is where models actually are important and applicable in the real world. And can we get actual practical speedups compared to attention? And I think 
this very often gets a little bit overlooked because modern hardware is designed in particular ways that you might have something that's theoretically faster, but when you apply it on actual hardware, it isn't um, as fast as you would think. And as a result, actually uh, doing the work to make it practically fast and showing that that uh, is achieved, I think is also very important. And kind of when, when uh, we started with designing our models and um, kind of trying to figure out how to incorporate those and match the performance of transformers, um, I think an important part whenever you do that kind of research is to try to stick as much as you can to recipes that already work. And I think one of the main parts of why SSM have succeeded is the fact that usually they sort of use a very typical transformer backbone, which is where we also started with. And essentially the only thing that we do on a typical transformer architecture is we just take out the uh, multi-query or multi-head attention and replace that with a uh, uh, with a new block that incorporates uh, a linear RNN. A few observations about this uh, kind of architecture is an easy way to think about, which I think is useful, is that the uh, MLPs blocks um, in some ways contain a lot more expressivity and they process things uh, per token while the essentially what's the multi uh, query attention or the recurrent blocks are things that focus on mixing between different time steps. So in some ways we can kind of think of these two partitions to one uh, computing expressive representations and the other one trying to combine information across time. And now to go into a little bit of detail of how our recurrent block actually looks in practice. It's a very similar to what a gated MLP block would look um, in, uh, in any modern transformer. And essentially it has two branches. One of them goes through a linear layer and a GLU and the other one goes through a linear layer. Um, after that, there's a very small temporal convolution, which usually its window size is just four. Um, and that is a small component that actually turns out is important for the RNN layer to work well. And there are some good arguments and intuitions, and you can look that in the uh, HIPPO paper that uh, this allows the linear RNN to express a lot more functions than it could on its own. And the output from the temporal convolution uh, goes inside the linear RNN, and those are combined together with a multiplicative gate, which, at least to my experience in practice, multiplicative gates almost always improve performance and are quite magical. And at the end, this is all projected to an output through another linear layer. An important part when we design actually some of these models at scale is that actually we have to start and think about how do we shard different parts. Um, since most models at scale, they require to be sharded across devices. And this actually becomes important because if you don't do this, then you're going to incur significant communication between devices. And that's going to start to make your models uh, slower. Uh, than a usual transformer. And so to achieve this, essentially everything that is um, inside this uh, red square uh, is essentially block sparse, where the number of blocks are constructed such that you can shard uh, across devices. And usually you would use either eight or 16 blocks because that's the usual uh, kind of number of devices across which you shard. Now we're going to dig a little bit in what the actual uh, linear RNN layer is. For this, I'm first going to start a little bit from previous work. Um, and this is in particular coming from the S4 paper, which is uh, kind of maybe one of the most popular earlier works on linear RNNs and SSMs that made these models very popular. Essentially, what it does is it defines a linear recur um linear recurrent network where um, the hidden state and the input are multiplied by this F and G uh, matrices, which are tied together through omega. And 
in sort of the more earlier work where this was motivated from a continuous, basically discretizing a continuous linear state space model, essentially the tying between F and G are related to the discretization scheme, whichever you pick for that continuous model. But I think in practice um, and later on, as it was shown in the literature, this discretization and this perspective doesn't necessarily have that much weight on the performers, at least on language uh, of these models. And kind of starting from this initial formulation, sort of follow-up work, um, essentially made the observation that uh, you can diagonalize the system, which basically means that you can uh, diagonalize the matrices F and G, and then essentially um, you can absorb uh, the singular vector matrices in any of the linear layers that are around the RNN, um, and then just do the recurrence uh, with just a diagonal, which makes all of the operation element-wise. And the main benefit of this is that you reduce the number of flops for every step from width squared to just width. There's quite a bit of works that show that you can recover the same expressivity through the fact that you have linear layers around the RNN. In practice, this is the case that essentially using diagonal RNNs is enough to get the same expressivity, and that's why the most uh, more recent work almost always just use diagonal RNNs. The only drawback of doing this diagonalization is that essentially now your diagonals have to be uh, complex numbers. So this makes the recurrence being complex and you have to do complex algebra, which sometimes uh, can be a little bit slower. Uh, but as we're gonna uh, see later, not in all modalities, and particularly in language, we find that using complex number is not necessary. And in fact, we can go away with just uh, diagonal real numbers. And kind of to, to um, show some of the performance, so initially here we first um, decided to try the S4D model just out of the box. Um, as it was from the previous slide in the same architecture as a transformer. And we compare it against an LSTM, which uh, essentially achieves quite similar performance to a transformer with the only caveat that it takes a lot uh, longer to actually train, just every step uh, is much more expensive. And out of the box, the S4D model actually showed a quite significant gap between the LSTM. And so we wanted to figure out a way to close that gap while still retaining the fast training and efficiency of the uh, linear RNN model. And to do that, uh, we found that one important feature was to include uh, what we call a gating mechanism. And uh, with that, we called the layer uh, an LRU. And I'm going to show in the next uh, few slides what the gating me mechanism actually looks like for this. But essentially, after we included this gating, the gap between the SSM model and the LSTM was fully closed, uh, while we still had all the efficiency gains uh, from fast training from um, similar to the S4D. Actually, demonstrate what the input gating is, is that essentially we have this uh, additional gate F in the uh, linear recurrence. And that is usually tied together with um, a gate G on the X. In our particular case, essentially, the gate allows you to um, not uh, care about the current token X and switch it off and potentially keep all the information from your previous hidden state. And essentially, this allows to uh, the memory of the RNN to keep um, a lot more informative inputs for a lot longer time. We think that this is one of the main reasons why uh, this works so well. And to do that, uh, essentially what the gate F is, um, is you take a sigmoid of a parameter that you have for the diagonal. In addition to that, essentially the gate work as a power on that sigma. And you can see that if the gate is zero, then the F becomes one. 
And in that case, the G becomes uh, zero, and then you keep the current hidden state transfer to the next time step. And in the case where the sigma is one, then essentially you just apply a linear combination between previous state uh, and new token. And kind of here, the caveat from before is that you need to make uh, this gating mechanism also block sparse for uh, efficient charging. And now with this recipe and plugged in back into the uh, S4D, we kind of have a recipe for how our um, SSM block looks like. And kind of an additional feature that when we were thinking about these models, we always found that the SSM slightly lack uh, in performance behind the uh, transformers. And however, uh, by the time when we had these results, kind of local attention was already something that people used in the literature. And we thought that this is a perfect match of combining these uh, two different ways, which both have a fixed state size, since in local attention, you also, uh, you, and when I say local attention, I mean sliding window attention, where you just keep the state of the previous K tokens. In practice, we found that the optimal way of combining these together is to have two recurrent blocks followed by one local attention block. Um, and this is how essentially our Griffin architecture uh, was formed. And this is what's, what we're still using as our main uh, recurrent model architecture to interleave these two. In, in our paper, we also obviously published results and for the pure RNN model, which we named Hawk. Um, and yeah, here I added the note that on language, which is where I'm gonna present the main results, we actually find that complex numbers are not needed in the, um, in the linear recurrence and real numbers achieve the same result, which essentially means that uh, I think one takeaway from this is that potentially for just modeling language, maybe you don't need uh, too strong uh, modeling for uh, different token, tokens interactions, uh, but you can go away with something uh, much simpler. And so now to kind of dive a little bit into some of our results, this is kind of a usual uh, scaling low curve where we plot both Hog Griffin and a very well-tuned multi-query attention transformer. Um, and as we can see, Griffin kind of perfectly matches the multi-query transformer and achieves the same uh, scaling curve and the same performance. Um, while Hawk, indeed, it does um, kind of perform slightly worse. Uh, however, usually as we increase uh, the scale, uh, it seems that the gap uh, is closing between Hawk and uh, the other two. And we've also, so this is results from the paper, which um, is uh, based on, I think, sequences length of 2K, while we have very similar results for sequences of 8K and of 32K as well. And kind of these are the usual numbers of downstream evaluations just to sort of showcase, and you can find them as well in the paper that um, in some ways, these models uh, not only have the same training loss, but actually on downstream evals, they achieve similar performance. Um, they are the caveats, however, that um, in certain tasks, they're slightly better, in certain tasks, they're slightly worse. And I think usually my experience is that in, math, in tasks that require more reasoning, they struggle a little bit more than global attention models. Um, while in other tasks, they're slightly better. And on average, they're essentially performing the same. Um, one, one important aspect of all this is how do we actually implement this to be efficient on actual devices? Um, and one part which I already talked about is that when you design your blocks, you have to take care uh, for efficient sharding. Another important part is that because the linear recurrence are now diagonal, they become memory bound, uh, which means that essentially the biggest portion of your time you spend in transferring states uh, between your HPM, which is the slow memory on a, in the accelerator and the fast memory. And there, unfortunately, most frameworks aren't too smart of how to efficiently do those things. So usually, 
if you actually care about this being practical, you need to implement a custom kernel for how to do that uh, more efficiently, such that you make the least transfers. Um, and in our case, we found out that using a custom kernel can give you up to four times speed up. Um, and um, also the recurrence can be parallelized, which is something that people have um, kind of done and emphasized a lot in the literature. One year with this diagonal element of the recurrence, um, because everything is memory bound, that means that making something faster in terms of flops does not necessarily help and actually running things just in a linear scan is enough. One, one important part on efficiency, which I think is often not discussed about this model, is um, that essentially the main benefit that you get is only if you have longer sequence lengths. And if we fix the sequence length and actually start increasing the model size by increasing the width of the model, what you're going to find out is uh, essentially that any benefits that you have, they're going to start to diminish because essentially you're going to start to spend significantly more of your flops into the MLP blocks. And um, in general, as you scale your models, essentially the MLP blocks start to significantly dominate your computation. So that's one thing that's important to keep in mind that essentially as you scale, unless you also increase the sequence length, the gains that you gain from changing the attention to an SSM would kind of start to diminish just because 95% of your computation now is just going to be in the MLPs. And also it's important to keep in mind that more newer techniques like flash attention, they can make uh, transformers efficient even at 32k thousand sequence length. And that's another thing that's important to compare against. On the inference side, in general, inference is always memory bound because we basically always just predict a single token at the time. And that means that we don't have enough flops to saturate the device. And essentially uh, what this means for transformers is that um, in order to have improvement with the SSMs on them, since the number of parameters are about the same, that memory bandwidth is always going to give you the same overhead. SSM start to matter whenever the, the size of the KV cache starts to be larger than the number of parameters. And this happens either when the sequence length is very large or when the batch size is very large. And essentially on the plot here, we see uh, for a fixed, uh, I think it's a batch size of one. As we increase the sequence length, what's the difference in uh, the latency for a transformer and one of the SSM models. And as we can see, a small number of tokens, maybe up to 512, the difference is very minimal because essentially most of your time you're spending in the parameters being loaded to device. This here is a plot with um, uh, what's the true output, which essentially here the SSM models achieve much faster true output by essentially being able just to fit larger batch sizes. Well, as we increase the sequence length, transformers, because of their KV cache, um, have to fit smaller and smaller batch sizes on device and their true output drops. In terms of the long context capabilities of the model, uh, this here, we test models that have been uh, trained using, uh, using uh, just the usual data set. And then we test them on the book corpus data set that have very long sequences up to, I think, 130K length. As we can see, uh, Griffin um, actually extrapolates really well um, on sequences much larger than what it has been trained on. So on the left-hand side, these are models that are trained on 2K sequence length. And on the right side, for comparison, we also show that if you train on uh, 8K sequence length, um, you can extrapolate all the way to 132K, which suggests that the SSM essentially are able to transfer information to uh, pretty uh, large distances. One important caveat for where these models are still struggling, and I think that's probably the main place where uh, there's place either for improvement or places where transformers might just stick, is the so-called needle in the haystack retrieval, 
which is when you have a large amount of uh, text, and after that, you ask the model to retrieve some very specific information from this text. And in those cases, the pure SSM actually performs quite bad. Griffin, which uses local attention, manages to do this much better. And in general, transformers perform really well up to the sequence length that they're trained on. One important thing to keep in mind is that this, this result isn't surprising in some ways the SSM always compresses the information from the sequence into a single hidden state. And kind of theoretically, you would never be able to retrieve exact information if you actually compress whatever the prompt was. So these results are not surprising, but I think it's important to keep in mind based on what kind of application people would want to use these models for, that if you uh, need these capabilities, probably um, SSMs would need to either be combined with attention um, or to be altered in different ways. And I think that there's even new papers came out recently about how you can change the way that the model process the prompt and a lot of other things around how we can get SSMs to work on this. And kind of with this, uh, I'm sort of on the end of my talk. Um, I think um, this is a good uh, a good time to say that SSMs are, I think, are performing on pure language um, performance very well on the same uh, on par with transformers. They scale well. They work at scale. Um, you can achieve the same performance. They're, they have very good extrapolation capabilities, and they're usually faster at inference time. Kind of the main weaknesses is that for haystack retrievals, they aren't uh, as good as transformers. And for in-context learning, they are a lot more sensitive to how you prompt them. And maybe here I'm going to put that we have open sourced the recurrent Gemma model, which is essentially a model based on the Griffin architecture for both 3B and 9B, which are available under the Google's uh, Gemma umbrella of models. You said you open sourced uh, Gemma models. Um, Gemma is not, the Gemma we usually hear about is not this model though, right? This is a, this is an SSM version of, I mean, how is it related? So Gemma at the moment is an umbrella of collection of models. There's a base Gemma model, which indeed is just a transformer. There is recurrent Gemma, which is available also on Hugging Face, Kaggle, and the same places. I think it's only not available on Vertex, but on all other places where the base Gemma model is available, they're available there. And those are essentially Griffin architecture models. So they are an SSM with local attention. We hosted a talk uh, with Dan uh, from Stanford. Uh, actually, Lonnie also was there. Uh, and uh, basically he was you know, describing uh, different uh, alternatives uh, to Transformer and actually about, uh, uh, he was talking about uh, the state space models. He mentioned that the companies like build the entire tech stack to sort transformer based models and it, and like they're so hooked up that it's it would at least by his estimate it would take at least six months and like really great machine learning systems and engineers to really transition you know serving some alternatives so which made me think that you know this kind of models they sh they should show like really order of magnitude performance right and efficiency in order to incentivize companies to make that shift because i mean obviously they don't want to you know stop their like business processes right for just incremental improvements so my question is do you think it's it's possible that alternatives uh might show that kind of level of improvement that companies on a production level can make that shift what do you think what's your intuition about that. Um, okay, yeah, without reveal, revealing anything that I shouldn't. Um, so whether that shift can happen, I think it's definitely possible. However, I think that there are a few important caveats in these that matter. One is this needle in the haystack retrieval issue. I think there's a situation in which companies care for um, to have that capability. 
which is something that either might need to be addressed for this model or probably companies might stick to the transformers. Um, and I think that usually is going to depend a lot, a lot on the actual task that uh, people are trying to solve. Um, and whenever that's needed, I think it would be a much more difficult sell to actually change uh, to using these models. However, it is definitely possible to see a lot more hybrids in practice. Um, and I think the other caveat is that indeed an inference time and this, um, I think I want to maybe emphasize it because it's usually not much talked about in the literature is that a lot of the time spent is just loading your parameters uh, from the device slow memory into the fast memory. So kind of a, if you have something that let's say it replies to questions and generates a hundred tokens, pretty much your main bottleneck is always like the whole computation doesn't matter. Your whole bottleneck is just the transferring of between memory. And if you're in that regime, probably people would not care so much to switch. Um, if you do care about very long sequences, in that case, I think these models can indeed replace transformers because kind of with them, you can achieve pretty much the same performance. I agree that at the moment, the software stack is very much engraved with transformers, which makes it quite difficult. And we found that, for instance, when we were trying to do our integration with Hugging Face, which required a lot of help from them as well in order to make it happen, because there's a lot of things that are kind of built in to work with that uh, structure. Um, but I think in general, so I would say if you have some tasks that are really long sequence and you don't care as much about the needle in the haystack uh, retrieval problem, then probably it's a very good choice to try to replace attention with these. I'm just trying to estimate how much you know, like resources it will save companies if they decide to make that shift? I would say that's a very difficult question to answer, unfortunately, because uh, kind of um, in some ways, once you get to actually productionizing any of these ideas, it starts to become a lot important how exactly is your company serving these things. And sometimes they can they can be done in different ways. Um, however, we have found out that indeed for uh, kind of a more classical language model cases, the fact that your um, state between the prompt processing and the actual generation of output is much smaller than a transformer, that um, additionally helps a lot. Because uh, kind of more classical setups is to have these separate prompt processing processes and generation. And also, I think if you can batch things together, um, there the true output benefits of these models really shines up and you can get some ridiculous numbers. I think, for instance, on the 9B recurrent Gemma, compared to the base Gemma, we got something like 400x higher true output. And that's mainly because we can f fit much larger batch sizes. Um, however, there may be like, for instance, Clever, have it on a device where a single user uses it, then you're always working on batch size one and you kind of can't get use of that. But yeah, I think it depends on a lot of things. You can, in the right applications, I think you can definitely have very significant uh, cost savings. In other applications, there won't be that many. So you mentioned that kind of the hybrid approach might work, right? But uh, I'm just wondering, do you think like on practical level, it, it, it might be possible despite like all the efforts, you know, that the companies should take in order to, you know, to make this transition? I think eventually that can happen, yes. I think it does require quite a lot of effort. And um, I think especially the more, um, the more big companies who have more to lose, they're slightly more risk averse with some of these uh, things that kind of change the architectures drastically. I do think that the hybrid approach uh, is probably the most viable in the short term for how do we improve and save computation on these models. That's, 
I think, yeah, that's very likely. I thought it was really interesting how you characterized the um, the needle in the haystack, essentially, retrieval of exact information. And it makes really perfect sense because the recurrent network is trying to generalize as it's going along, you know, basically everything that came in the past. So it's intuitively, it makes a lot of sense. Um, attention, though, I mean, I also kind of intuitively feel like it gets sort of has a natural bias towards more recent information also, you know, may, you know, just because the distribution of training data, the stuff that's more recent, you know, is, is always more relevant, uh, you know, almost always. It does kind of seem like a recurrent network might be able to say, hey, you know, way back there, this general topic seems relevant to what's happening now. And, you know, I could imagine like an attention layer that instead of having this order n squared uh, attention matrix would, you know, be able to take that information and say, okay, let's center our attention matrix over on this area that the recurrent network says looks like it's relevant right now. Um, you know, so it wouldn't have to be remembering exact stuff, but the attention layer maybe could, and maybe the attention layer could remain really small, even though the buffer is really large. So I don't know. It seems really interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think in general, different approaches trying to address that are always interesting and there might be different ways to uh, do it. Um, I think I've seen recent papers where they essentially allow the RNN to just go back and process the prompt again and essentially kind of flip the this thing rather than asking the question after to ask it before, in which case indeed RNNs then perform much better uh, in those situations. Uh, one, one thing nevertheless I would say is that um, since in all of these cases, the models are not explicitly trained to do this needle in the haystack retrieval. In general, unless you fine tune them a little bit on those tasks, I think for the RNN it's gonna be slightly more difficult to um, get really good performance on that compared to transformers where I agree attention has some kind of recency bias and that's also with the positional encodings. But in general, it's a lot more just does this token look similar to what I'm asking? Basically, why, why now? Like, I see like in the last six months, like so many, you know, attempts uh, to, to catch up with the transformer performance. Like, well, what, what has happened uh, in the industry or in academia that uh, researchers start like thinking about this, about solving this problem? I think probably this has happened in the more recent months because actually it took a lot of time <clears throat> until we actually arrive at these uh, very performant variants of SSMs. I think so kind of if you look a little bit back, initially there was a lot of emphasis on um, thinking of this as a discretization of continuous system. And for a long time they were using dense matrices, which um, then made a lot of more emphasis on parallelization and kind of using the so-called associative scans and then using this gating mechanism that we introduced and uh, kind of at similar time, a little bit earlier than us, Mamba was published, which also had that gating mechanism. I think actually that gating mechanism makes a, quite a lot of difference in improving the performance and it was probably a very important ingredient that was kind of find very recent. Otherwise, I think people for quite a while have been thinking of how can we improve transformers themselves. And that's where flash attention uh, came out from. And there's more recent work on trying to compress the KV cache and so on. But I think maybe also and in the more recent time for the first time, we start to have models that actually operate on really large sequences. Because if you look at training on 2K sequence, the actual training time of um, the RNN and the transformer, there is some minor marginal improvement, but it's not much. It's kind of like doing a dot product on 2K by 2K matrix is like fine. It's nothing special. Once you get to, let's say, 32K sequence length, then things actually matter a lot. And these kind of sequence length are something that very recent have actually came out in practice. And I think that's why these kind of things now is the time when they actually start to make a difference. Before that, it was a little bit more, oh, they should be faster, but 
um, actually, I don't know, the devices were having kind of scale to keep up with that. And I think now in the past six months to eight months is where these problems were like more of an actual issue. Post pre-training um, things that, you know, people do with um, transformers like, uh, you know, alignment to conversational style and, and, and human reinforcement. <laughs> reinforcement learning from human feedback. Are you, are you at that or is it too early for those kind of things? So the actually the recurrent Gemma that's open, it has both a pre-trained version and an instruction tuned version that essentially has gone through um, kind of safety training and then RLHF. So in some ways we do pretty much the same, almost the same pipeline as a usual model would go through. And in, we don't see kind of any of the gaps between the models changing once we get there. They kind of, both models are on par with the uh, equivalent transformers. Does the gated MLP make a difference in the model performance or it's a nice to have? I think in general, not like in general, the gated MLP always performs better than a non-gated MLP and kind of in all of our experiments. And I think pretty much all of the, current transformers architectures, they use gated MLPs. And indeed for our block, we intentionally wanted something similar because kind of from our experience, somehow gating always helps. Um, so maybe as a general suggestion, if you have a model, just sprinkle some gating here and there, probably is gonna make things better. Um, but yeah, so it does improve performance and that's why it's kind of like, uh, I think nowadays it's just the standard, essentially. I wonder in general, there was lots of efficient transformer work maybe four years ago or three years ago, there's an efficient transformer paper. What makes this set of models different from the set of yeah. models from 2020, 2021? Uh, how come we're... I guess it's a bit of a repeat of Sophia's question, but uh, it seems, is it... Uh, that we build models that are more hardware friendly now, uh, much like you say in your summary slide, or is it that we found out new architecture tricks or, or as you said, is it the data sets that are more long range friendly now and we finally have, have some interesting data sets, which, which are the, what, what, what are the tastiest ingredients in this uh, kind of soup? I might not be able to fully answer because unfortunately I wasn't even in the transformer space four years ago. So I don't remember exactly what has been done back then. I uh, think that there I, I'm has not, been... I'm not sure if it was exactly four years, but there's uh, some paper from Google <laughs> where they were trying to survey uh, efficient transformers and there was some LSH and some sliding window tricks and... Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. lo lots of lots of attempts, but uh, yeah, I don't know if you would check that part out. But I think I remember there was some work on, for instance, linear attention, which um, in some ways you can rewrite linear attention as an RNN, and then you can use kind of similar things to what we have here. And this is sort of in a similar direction of trying to make these things better. However, nevertheless, there you still have a lot of number of flops that you have to compute. So I would say it's essentially a combination of the things that you mentioned. We do now have architectures that are more hardware friendly. And in some ways the hardware is designed for these architectures as well. So it's a two way street. And there's also some architecture innovations to make the architectures better and more efficient as well. So it's kind of a, I wouldn't say that there's any one single thing that's making these things better, but it's a combination of multiple things that have changed since then. And I think SSMs in some way were the more drastic step in how can we change the architecture such that it's inherently more efficient because it always has uh, less flops and also the hidden state is always fixed, which is different. One thing to mention in this is that we have also experiment with comparing against transformers that have only sliding window attention. So they have pure local attention. Usually those actually perform worse and they perform more even than Hawk. So in some ways the, the, lo the pure local attention models are not, um, not as good as some of these. And I think that's why they, because I think that that was also, there is a paper that 
tries to do that, but in some ways that's why pure local attention transformers have not gained any traction because they actually um, have a significant gap to the global attention ones and they never manage to close it. Mm -hmm.